And it really is focused on making, making the worker's life easier. Um, but you have to convince them of that. They're, they're, in the end, they're the customers that we're delivering to, the, the workers on the shop floor. So we, uh, we, we definitely have change management in mind as we're going through this. Welcome to Coffee with Mr. IoT, a weekly chat with Robert Schmidt, Deloitte's chief futurist, and the builders, dreamers, founders, and wild children of the IoT universe. This podcast can also be viewed on the Coffee with Mr. IoT YouTube channel. Hello, welcome to Coffee with Mr. IoT. My name is Robert Schmidt, also known as Mr. IoT. Today, my guest on the show is Pierre Hartoff. Director of Advanced Manufacturing Strategy at Spirit Aerosystems. Did I say that right? You did. You did. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. It's great to have you. Spirit Aerosystems. Tell us a little bit because you're not the airline. Sure. Um, <laughs> it might be worthwhile just explaining um, what you do. Yeah, so Spirit Aerosystems, we're the world's largest tier one aerostructures company. Uh, we've got six loca seven locations worldwide. Um, we, do, we did about $7.2 in revenue last year. We have, uh, and by large aerostructures, I mean we do the, for instance, on all the Boeing airplanes, 737, 67, 777, 87, we make the Section 41, which is the forward portion of the airplane, the nose. Uh, 737, we do the entire fuselage. It ships by train. So I sat in one of your structures today. You did. If you flew, if you flew here, you likely flew on something that, that Spirit builds. So we do... Uh, Fuselage is about 50% of our revenue, and that's forward, mid, and aft fuselage uh, portions. We also have 25% roughly of the revenues in propulsion, which is pylons, so what holds the engine onto the wings, mm -hmm. uh, thrust reversers, engine cowlings. And then uh, the other 25% is wing, so we do leading edges, trailing edges, control surfaces, those type of things. So I'm curious, right, when I fly, I don't get to see what the structures are made out of. Um, and there is, you know, I know old planes were built out of aluminum. What are you building out of today? What's still built out of aluminum? What's built out of carbon fiber? Sure. Give us a little bit. I, I, let's kick out just a little bit. I'd love to hear. Great question. So um, your, the legacy airplanes, if you will, the 737, the 67, the 47, those are all metallic structures. Uh, so, so it's that's, not even aluminum. It's yeah, it's aluminum. Yep. Is aluminum. There, there's a lot of aluminum. So the skins are aluminum, stringers, frames. Um, there's also stainless steels in there, titaniums, those type of things. Uh, the newer airplanes, the 787, Airbus's A350, are composite carbon fiber skinned airplanes. Um, so those we use, we, uh, we use automated fiber placement. So these are big machines that lay down strips of carbon fiber. Uh, to, to build those airplanes. Those airplanes, they're called composite airplanes because the outside, the skins are composite, but there's still a lot of metallic content on the inside. So you've still got a lot of aluminum. <clears throat> a lot of times, uh, aluminum and carbon don't do well together from a corrosion perspective. So when you have metal touching uh, composite, a lot of times you have titanium in there because the titanium is, is good galvanically compared to carbon. So a lot of titanium and, and aluminum and steel still even in those ca carbon airplanes. So I gotta assume shifting from metallic, as you call it, to carbon fiber must be a big change for production and you and manufacturing. How big was the change? What does that mean for a company like yours to go Very through a transition like this? Yeah, so um, it's a new competency. You have to, you have to, it has to become a core competency for you. So that was a big transition uh, going from from metallic to carbon. Uh, a lot of differences in in the manufacturing process of the basic fabrication. Once you get up to the assembly, though, there's still a lot of similarities. Um, you know, they're still bolted together. There's different types of bolts, but still bolts, still drilling holes. So some of those things transfer, uh, but there was certainly a lot of new competency that had to be developed for those for those new airplanes. So I. I, I just got a, a pilot's license and so I'm watching a lot of YouTube on how people building planes. And there is also this whole sort of like, oh my God, do I want to step in a plane that someone drills a hole in? And you're talking about bolts and stuff like this, but actually there's a lot more to, and, and this goes into what you call the factory of the future, right? But you know, you're not just bolting stuff together. I mean, there is certain specs and there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You know, otherwise I just feel like I'm sitting in the garage and bolting something together with my wrench, 
which <laughs> that's not what it is. There's, there's a lot of fasteners in airplanes. Um, you know, in just the, the fuselage that we build, there's over 250,000 uh, rivets, airplane, rivets and bolts. Yeah, airplane. yeah, per airplane, so a lot. Um, I would say on our, on our legacy airplanes, on the, on the metallic ones, um, about 50% of those are automated. Uh, we have big, big uh, automated fastening machines that go in there, drill the holes, and fill them. We call it drill and fill, but that's essentially putting in the rivet, and uh, rivets then get uh, bucked. We call it bucking the rivet, where you squeeze the rivet. Um, in, in some cases, in a lot of high load areas, those type of things, a lot of times we'll use uh, different fasteners, so bolts that are, that are fastened in there. Um, so again, about 50% of that is automated, so very, very high quality, very repeatable. Lots of uh, consistency, wow, and you know exactly yep. what pressure these rivets can take and how they right. respond. And so yeah, and, and so the, all the OEMs have, have specs for everything we do. There's, there's specs for sealing, there's specs for putting in fasteners, there's specs for torquing, so everything is rigidly controlled and, and documented, and of course, you know, with the flying public in mind, there's, everything's double-checked with, with quality. When there's a logbook actually that has to be kept throughout the production of oh, a plane, absolutely. right? So, I mean, there's a lot of history that we don't know when we step on a plane. Yeah, absolutely. Every part has its own, you know, from down from the raw material that's received, there's certification that the strengths are what they're supposed to be. And then as the parts are, are made, there's, there's a traceability, part records, quality records that go with every single part, even down to those little rivets. Those little rivets, uh, 250,000 of them. Yep. So. The fact of the future. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. It's a project that we're doing with you. Um, tell us a little bit about it. What is it about? What are you trying to achieve? And what's really the change for um, me as a passenger out there in uh, one of the structures you make? Sure. Uh, fun fundamentally, the, the flying public won't really see a change. The structure is going to be the same. It still has to meet those exact same specs. But what we're doing is really uh, focused on making life easier for the shop mechanic. That's really the best way to distill it. Um, you know, in, in, in the old way of doing things, we had, like I said, we have about 50% of, of the fasteners on, on those metallic airplanes are auto-fastened, uh, but there's still 50% that then means there's manual, manual labor involved. But either way, manual or auto, um, there's still a lot of time spent by the mechanics, by the leads, searching for parts, finding out where their part is, what, what's gonna go on the machine, at what time, those type of things. So we're trying to digitize that and add a digital thread all throughout the factory. And that's really where we asked Deloitte to come in and help us on an application that we've now named FloorSight. Um, and so floor and site, floor like and site the together, shop floor and the site scene. Exactly, okay. exactly. Um, so we we started, we piloted it. The pilot began in April of this year, 2019. Uh, went went pretty darn well. We did it in a in a localized area. What's There's pretty darn well? What pretty does that darn mean? Well how do you meaning? measure darn well? I love it. It's sort of like the. But I'm curious how you think about darn well. It's uh, we. You know, with anything in new technology, it, it takes a while for the for the people that are using it to to really understand what it's taken. But the but the, yeah, change management was critical there. But we uh, we got a lot of great feedback from the industrial engineers that were the ones that that typically would come in early in the morning, you know, spend a couple hours looking at master schedule requirements, finding out what part availability was, and then trying to merge those together to create a plan of the day. And of course, everything was done spreadsheets or handwritten and they create a plan of the day for the machines um, and then two hours later they come back and of course you know don't have this part or something happened on the machine and have to redo everything and then come back at, at lunchtime and update the plan of the day and at the end of the day plan goes in the trash and you come in the morning and start all over. With, with FloorSight what we developed is uh, a couple different things. One we're using RFID tracking uh, so that we can track parts as they're coming from the kitting area to the machines and throughout the floor so we understand exactly where parts are. So the part has a little tag on it yep. and you have sensors or um, antennas really inside your factory floor that tracks where every part is at exactly. what point in time. So we have a gate when it leaves the kitting area, we've got a gate into a staging area near different, and there's a couple different machines that we have these on, eight different machines. Um, there's a gate when it goes onto the machine so we can try and know that it's on the machine and it comes off the machine. Um, so we track all that so, so we have transparency for the mechanics and for the supervisors of exactly where their parts are. We've tapped back into our 3PL provider 
um, so we understand part availability at the you know in the warehouse. So the third-party logistic provider that exactly. helps with getting everything there. Okay. Exactly. So we can tap into and understand exactly where parts are, um, if there's shortages, and we can see hey, maybe there's a part in stock. Those type of things. Can you switch parts when one part is not available? Sometimes, not um, always. We can't switch parts. You would have we, but we do have workarounds. So if yeah. you know. Uh, if a stringer is not available or something happened to it is damaged or something like that and it can't be auto fastened on the machine, you do what you can on the machine and then you travel that work to a different station and, and do the work there. So, this sounds like an amazing, what's your role in all of this? Um, so, I'm Director Advanced Manufacturing Strategy, so that's, that's really our term for uh, Factory of the Future. We, we've actually, we could actually... So it's your baby, it's your it's brainchild? Baby. Yeah, so I'm the engineering director. I have a counterpart who who's, uh, runs our integrated product team, IPT. Um, so I've, I've got the industrial engineers, the principal architects that, that are really the solution architects for these things. And then we, we have a bunch of different partners like Deloitte and others, machine suppliers, automation suppliers that we've, we've brought together under a, the umbrella of a collaboration agreement we think is pretty unique. Uh, where we, we can all work together to get the best of, of all the different parties as opposed to you know create a machine spec and throwing it over the fence and see who comes back with the best bid. We were able to take bits and pieces from different companies and combine them to a better overall solution. Yeah, I often say IoT is a, is a team sport, right? And so it seems like you have made some interesting uh, collaboration agreements. What did you do to make us all work together with each other? What were some of the few tips you'd give someone that wants to go down that road. Ah, so yep, yeah, so it, it took us a while and we've been on we've been on both sides of these type of, of arrangements with our OEMs. Um, and then we created this one uh, where we're kinda on the other on the other side of the fence where we're the ones benefiting. Uh, but we but it it has to be a partnership first of all, so everybody has to get something out of it. Um, IP is always at the center of these intellectual property is always at the center of these agreements. So we had to come up with with uh, I'd say somewhat unique ways of handling IP. So we, we took a lot of learning from, from that pilot, um, good feedback, uh, but it didn't have everything that, that the shop floor needed. And we had, we had some, uh, it was a pilot, um, so it didn't have everything. We didn't have all the right connections to our internal IT. Mm. Um, so we had to go through a tunnel and didn't have real-time feeds of data and couldn't, couldn't read directly from SAP and those type of things. Um, so we took those learnings, we did a version 1.5 uh, in the summertime, and that that got really that got really well received, and we started seeing benefits. You know, 30% uh, less time people searching parts in the day. Um, machine utilization has gone up by over 10%. So really good uh, things there. So now we're working on 2.0, Foresight 2.0. Uh, we just started on that, and that is basically taking what we developed for those eight machines and exploding it out. Outward, so we're going downstream, back into the skin, skin fab area, uh, before it gets fastened, and then we're also taking it upstream. So after we've created skin panels, then you start assembling them into a tube, essentially. So we're taking it upstream to those assembly areas as well. So I, I want to just re-say some of the things because they fascinate me. One of the things I heard you say was, um, it's not good enough just to have IoT as the machine, machine put some sensors on it or track stuff. You got to connect it with what already exists, your ERP systems and so forth. And right. you learned that through your pilot and changed that, and that made a big difference. Is what I heard. It did. Yep. And then I heard also you saying you increased your machine utilization by ten percent, which is also amazing, or over ten percent. Um, does that mean actually you're making those structures faster now? It takes less time? Um, I would say we're reducing the amount of non-value added time in the system. So machines are still you know, putting a rivet in every five seconds. That doesn't go any faster. But what we're, what we're reducing is the amount of time the machine's sitting there waiting for a part, um, which, which is key. There's a lot of, a lot of time. That well, which means you can make wasted. more. Right. You can make more overall. How long does it take to make one of those parts? Uh, those machines, um, so we're talking about you know, a 40 foot long panel and uh, you know, about a quarter of the airplane tube like that. Those have run times anywhere from four to seven hours. It sounds like an amazing job. It is. It's um, really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's very cool. Um, you've been in the airline business for quite a long time. 
Um, how do you get a job like this? Can you tell us a little bit about your history, your start? You told me about the startup story. That's really fascinating. Um, love to hear about that a little sure. bit. So I, as, as we spoke before, I grew up in uh, Kansas. Went to Wichita State University. Go Shocks. Um, <laughs> and we, uh, Are they doing good this year? So I did. Uh, yeah, we got a good basketball team. They're, they're young, but they're doing pretty darn well. Um, so did my bachelor's and master's in aerospace engineering. While I was there, I worked at an institute on campus, the National Institute for Aviation Research. I worked in the composites lab, so I'm really a composites guy. Mm. Uh, so I left school, I went uh, to Denver, went to a startup company called Adam Aircraft and spent nine great years there, really learning. Starting, I was employee number six and we got up to over a thousand. So I got to, got to learn how to grow a company and you built an airplane, right? I mean, yeah. you designed it. Oh, yeah, we designed one. clean sheet, designed, certified through the FAA, started delivering what to customers. Kind of so it? it was a six seat, small, small airplane, six seater uh, pusher puller. So it had two engines, but they were on the front and the back of the fuselage. So tail booms. Uh, really neat, mostly composite airplanes. So Do they still fly? There's, there's a couple of them still out there, yep. And then we, uh, so that, as that company, that company, you know, we did great, but eventually, through the financial crisis went under. Um, so I did a little bit of consulting and then I came back to, to Wichita. I got married and my wife and I are both close to our family. So we came back home. Um, worked at Learjet for about six years and then moved over to uh, Spirit. So you went bigger and bigger and bigger planes in a way. I did, I did. <laughs> and I went, from, I went from composites and new product development uh, for most of my career, you know, just developing new, comp new airplanes, not really working on the manufacturing side of things, but designing and certifying. And then I went, went to big time production rates at Spirit, and it's been, a, it's been a great journey. So learning a completely different side of the business. And you said you're not a pilot, right? No, I started taking lessons. So I know, I know how to fly, but I don't have my license. I always thought everybody who works there must be a pilot because they're so excited about it. Uh, is that sort of like, you know, you think you got to become a pilot at some point or you kind of like so much around the airplanes that you don't want to do anything with it anymore? No, I think I will eventually. Once the kids get older, I think I'll have a little time to, to get that license. So I wanted to sort of close out talking a little bit about where do you see this go? What do you, I'm almost kind of like wondering when you, you've, you've been now, you're on 2 you've gone through the very early parts of it, you've learned. Um, where do you see this go in a couple of years? What are you missing? And, and how do you deal with the change of this, right? I mean, there's always talk when automation happens, what happens to employees, how do they feel, and so forth. So can we talk a little bit about the soft factors sure. around this? Absolutely. And where do you see it going? Yeah, we talk about it all the time, actually. It's, uh, you know, I, I tell people I'd not to downplay the, the technical things that we have to overcome because there's certainly technical challenges, but I think the bigger challenges are the change management or the cultural change that has to happen as you bring in automation. So technology isn't really the challenge anymore for you? Um, it's, it's out there for the most part and being used. The, the challenge is finding ways to make it useful in our specific, in aerospace, in the manufacturing environment, um, which certainly has its challenges with part size and part count and those type of things. Um, so there, there's certainly challenges in augmenting those technologies and bringing, the, bringing different pieces together and making them work in aerospace. But, but it's, as any change, you know, we're fundamentally trying to change the way we, we build airplanes uh, through automation. And it really is focused on making, making the worker's life easier. Um, but you have to convince them of that. They're, they're, in the end, they're the customers that we're delivering to, the, the workers on the shop floor. So we... Uh, we, we definitely have change management in mind as we're going through this. Looking out a few years, yeah, what are you thinking? Out. So floor site, we're, we're, like I said, we're expanding it into more and more of the factory. Uh, we've already got areas of the factory that don't have it, that have seen it. And, and want have, it? Have started wanting it. So that's oh, that's great, excellent. That's a great part of the change management. Um, we've noticed that people uh, downstream of the machines that are in the park kitting area are actually looking at looking at the app and looking at the areas that their customers are, that they're delivering to, and starting to see things through their eyes. So we thought that was really neat. Um, so we, we want to expand it throughout the factory and to different, different uh, buildings as well. We've got over 12 million square feet of, of space at Spirit at six different sites. And uh, just at the Wichita, the main headquarters, there's, uh, we're almost a, a square mile of different facilities there. So there's a lot of different places to, to move the application. 
Well, thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. It was great. Um, appreciate I the opportunity. You got on planes all day long, and so it's great to meet you. Hopefully, I get to stop by. You need someday. to come to Wichita. Yeah, I'm actually in Wichita the week after next. So, oh, yeah, well, I'm you gotta, you gotta come by. You know how to find me. I know how to find you. I'll give you the tour. Awesome. Thank you. And with that, we have another coffee with Mr. ID coming to an end. If you missed part of today's show or any past shows, please check out the playlist. And with that, have a great day. Bye. Thanks for listening to Coffee with Mr. IoT. To subscribe or to listen to more episodes, search for Coffee with Mr. IoT in your favorite podcatcher or find us online at Deloitte.com backslash US backslash Coffee with Mr. IoT. To watch the video version of our show, go to YouTube and search Coffee with Mr. IoT.